the consequences of philosophy are unbelievably either on the good side or on the bad side. Now, personal philosophy. You know, there's religious philosophy and spiritual philosophy, and there's economic philosophy and social philosophy. Okay, economic, political, all kinds of philosophies, right? Where did we come from and where are we going? And what is the meaning of life? Philosophy is a big tent with many different divisions. But the one I want to talk primarily about today and then expand from that is your personal philosophy. So jot this down, one of the best notes for the day. Each person's personal philosophy. is the greatest determining factor in how your life works out. Each person's personal philosophy is the greatest determining factor in how your life works out. Your economic life, your personal life, your social life, your spiritual life, all starts with the conclusions you've made in your personal philosophy. We gave the example earlier, earlier on economics. There's three or four different philosophies to choose from in your economic future. Now make this note. Personal philosophy is like a guidance system. A guidance system. And it has to start early. When a child goes to school, they've got to have a pretty good guidance system working. And this guidance system does just two things primarily. Here's number one. This guidance system helps you to see the dangers over here and try to minimize those or eliminate some of those. That's one of the first orders of human existence is to learn early where the dangers are so they don't swallow you up don't devastate you economically, socially, personally, or lose your life. Kids have to get this guidance system working early to spot the signals of the dangers that could wreck their chances to live a good life. Now, this guidance system also helps you to see over here the opportunities so that you could maximize those. So if you learn to minimize the dangers, maximize the opportunities within this working environment now, we call this working things out to live a good life. But you can't possibly live much of a good life if you don't keep learning where the dangers are so you can avoid those and learn where the opportunities are so that you can maximize those. That's about as simple as I can put working on your personal philosophy. Now, why is it this way? Why is life both danger and opportunity? Here's the best advice I can give you. The storyteller probably gives us, you know, more to think about than in detail. But here's what it seems like. And that's one of the best phrases to use if you're going to make your studies and try to come to some good conclusions. It seems like, it seems like, God wished to create for the humans he made a great adventure. Seems like. According to the storyteller, it seems like God wished to create a great adventure for the humans he created. That's the best explanation I've got, seems like. And it seems like God's always wanted some kind of adventure. It said when he was alone in heaven, according to the storyteller, he created all these angels. That must have been fun. Doesn't say how long it took. Doesn't say how many. But evidently, he sought adventure. Part of the adventure, I guess, in those early times before the creation, was in heaven with the angels he created. Now then, he also creates an angel that's the best and the brightest of the angels called Lucifer. 
And so begins, according to the storyteller, one of the great adventures of all time. And along the way, the idea occurred to Lucifer that he could take over God's place, become God in his place. And he persuaded, according to the storyteller, he persuaded a third of the angels to go with him on this insurrection. So begins an unbelievable adventure. Seems like that's what God wishes, some great adventure. Not just sit up there and float around on the cloud. Create some angels, create Lucifer. Lucifer persuades a third of the angels to go with him in insurrection. Now they lose out, and uniquely enough, according to the storyteller, that God doesn't kill them all. That would end the adventure. But rather cast them out of heaven down to earth. And so now continues this unique story of Lucifer and his, the third of the angels now cast to earth, creates another adventure. Interesting. The Bible is such a fascinating book, giving us seemingly, you know, what God delights in and seems like God delights in creating this unique adventure. Ancient, one of the ancient stories says God and Satan were talking things over one day. I thought, well, that didn't seem possible. But the storyteller says they're looking down on the earth and they're talking things over. I thought, wow, that's remarkable. God and Satan getting together and, and talking things over. Now, the storyteller doesn't give us many details, so we've got to use our imagination. And on this particular occasion, God got to bragging on one of his favorite creation, his favorite person, it's called Job. He said, Job and I have got this great friendship going. Job and I, we walk together. Job and I plan the future together. Job, Job, Job. Finally, Satan had it up to here with Job, Job, Job. And he said, yeah, God, Job, you've got a wall built around him. I can't get to him. God said, well, what would you expect? He's my favorite person. Of course, I got a wall built around him. Now they're having this conversation. It's fascinating. Storyteller says, Satan gets this bright idea. Said, hey, God, let's try this. God said, what? If you'll take the wall of protection down from around your favorite friend, Job, he said, I promise you within a short period of time, your favorite friend will curse you to your face. God said, no, he'd never do it, not in a hundred years, no matter what. Satan said, well, how are we going to know? Would you like to make a wager? It doesn't give us the details of the wager. But the storyteller says God picked up the bet and said, okay, let's try it. I'll take the wall down from around my special friend, Job. You do your best. I promise you, no matter what you do, he'll never curse me. Satan said, the bet is on. According to the terms of the wager, God did take the wall down from around his special friend, Job. And Satan then does one of his all-time famous numbers. According to the storyteller, first Satan took his wealth, stripped him of his wealth. Satan said, that'll do it. Where's your friend God? He didn't curse God. Satan said, well, number two, took his health. Below number two, surely now he'll curse his friend God. No. Below number three, and the worst, took his family. His health, his wealth, and his family. Gone. Satan said to God, here's where he does it. And sure enough, Job's wife comes along and says, Job, looks like your friend God has long forsaken you. You might as well curse him and die. And Satan says, here's where he does it. And God says, well, he hasn't talked yet. And while they both listen, Job says, 
Never would I curse my friend God, no matter what happens. God said, I knew it. I knew it. And picked up the bet, whatever it was, doesn't matter. Isn't that a fascinating story? Now, I, I say all of that to illustrate this. It seems like God delights in great adventure. And the only way to have great adventure, it seems like, is to have both danger and opportunity and us with the possibility of figuring it out. Jot this down. Now, it's a nice little list. On one from other people is to just pick up the signals. Part of it is by sight. Here's a good watchword for the 21st century. Pay attention. No use falling into the same trap somebody else fell into. No use living a mediocre life like somebody else has chosen. Take a look and say, is that what you really would like? Say, no. Here's somebody that never read the books, never made the changes. There was a class and they didn't take it, a skill and they never learned it, a discipline and they never tried it. And they blame the government and blame taxes and blame society and they blame circumstances and all the rest. They don't know. And the key is watch carefully. Don't you fall into that same trap. That's how we learn from what we see. Here's next. If we learn from what we see, we put some of this on video so you can see it again and again and again. Next, you learn from what you hear. We put it on CDs so you can hear it, and hear it, and hear it. We don't ask you to come to just one symbol. We ask you to come and listen again, listen again. Here's what the early Christians were taught. Don't neglect the assembly. When we call an assembly, do your best to be there because you never know which of these assemblies is gonna change your life forever. You'll never be the same again. And you can't.